Testing, one, two, three. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I gather everyone's awake from, from the reaction to, to Brian's intro there. Um, I'm Linus. I discovered Nix and Nix OS for myself in 2016 and quickly became convinced that that's the way I want to do all my computing. I joined the ranks of Nix packages, contributors. Um, hang on, that's, something's wrong here. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Uh, I joined the ranks of Nix Packages contributors and have been following the call of Nix in my career since graduating from university. Along the way, I've managed two Nix OS releases, and I've been on the RSE steering committee since 2021. We're looking for new members, by the way, so get in touch if, in your, if you're interested in helping. I work at Determinate Systems, where we're working on making the Nix the best choice for working together. So what's NixOS? NixOS is an operating system based on the Nix package manager and Linux. Linux is an operating system kernel, which means it runs on the hardware and mediates access to that hardware by the user space, uh, providing abstractions to allow applications and services to care less about what exact hardware they're running on and allocating resources to allow multiple processes to run at once. I'm going to talk about how we get from a bootloader to a complete operating system, then compare how traditional Linux distros and NixOS fit the pieces together, and then showcase some of the possibilities that NixOS puts within easy reach. When did that happen? <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> Tell me if that happens again. Uh, so, uh, when you power on your computer, a number of things happen. The first that we're interested in is the bootloader. It's what's responsible for loading both Linux itself and for giving it the startup parameters needed for getting the user space up and running. Some widespread bootloaders include Grub and Systemd boot, and especially in the non-desktop world, U-boot. These startup parameters are usually the command line and the init ramfs. The command line tells the kernel uh, some configuration that, uh, that applies before the user space can, uh, can take care of that, such as uh, logging behavior, how to respond to crashes, or what user space to actually start. Um, and the init ramfs is a bit more interesting for our purposes. The init ramfs, which is an abbreviation of initial ram file system, is where user space starts. It's a tree of files, traditionally stored as a disk image. Uh, nowadays, usually, it's an archive. Um, it contains everything that the system needs to boot. The kernel will run a program, often just called init, uh, from the init ramfs as the first user space process. R the role of that process is to get everything ready for the real system. Modern desktop kernels are usually modular, meaning that they don't include drivers for every every piece of hardware they support, instead loading them as modules later on. This makes kernels significantly smaller and faster to load, uh, but that also means that um, drivers like storage uh, for things like storage devices and file systems, which you need to be able to start the actual system, aren't included in the kernel itself. That's why it's part of the init ramfs's job to include and load these drivers. Um, other things it does is, uh, if applicable, for example, asking the user for encryption keys um, or setting up networking in case uh, the user wants to enter the encryption keys via the network or the uh, root file system is on the network, things like that. Once it's done those things, it will usually mount the root file system and pass control on to the next init, that of the real system. So the init in a root file system then starts up the rest of the user space. On a typical desktop system, this includes services like clock synchronization and, uh, and network management. 
One of the services is also the login service, which provides login prompts both on the text consoles and uh, the display manager, which provides graphical login. So let's look at how a traditional distro like Debian fits these pieces together. The kernel is a package managed by the system package manager. It includes both the kernel image itself, which is what the bootloader loads, and the modules it needs to support a wide range of hardware. The package includes post-installation scripts, which the other parts of the boot chain can hook into in order to reconfigure themselves once you get a new kernel. The initramfs tools package handles generation of the initramfs. Installs a kernel post-installation hook so that whenever you get a new kernel, uh, it'll generate a new initramfs by collecting some information from the system, uh, from config files and, and such. Uh, config files like etcfs tab, uh, which defines the file systems that are supposed to be mounted, etc crypt tab, uh, which defines encrypted file systems, things like that. It then copies the contents. Uh, well, it, it puts all these pieces into a temporary directory, uh, so these pieces being kernel modules, init scripts, the dependencies of the init scripts and the configuration files for them into a temporary directory and generates an archive from that temporary directory, which is the init ramfs. The bootloader is also a package managed by the system package manager. The package contains both the bootloader itself and, again, scripts for installing it to the hard drive and for generating its configuration. The installation scripts are usually only run when the bootloader is installed or upgraded, and the configuration scripts, uh, those define the actual boot options, so the, the kernel command line init ramfs combinations. So they run every time, they also hook into the kernel post installation scripts and run every time you install a new kernel. And both the init ramfs tools and the bootloader can be configured via a multitude of files in slash nc. Of course, you're all here for Nix and NixOS, so let's have a look at how NixOS does it. One key concept of NixOS is the system package, or top level. The entire system configuration is built into a single package, which depends on everything the system needs. I've taken the liberty of illustrating this part visually. So of course, the kernel is going to be a dependency of the system package. Um, I think someone's seen this video before. Uh, <laughs> the command line is part of the config. So into the system package it goes. Uh, the init ramfs, we can build that in Nix into the system package. Um, now the bootloader, uh, we have a slight problem here. The system can only have one bootloader installed at a time. Uh, let me hand wave away the slight technical inaccuracy of that statement. But we still want to be able to install it. Uh, so we have an installation script. And where do we put that? in the system package. <laughs> As for the bootloader config, um, we also have a problem there. Uh, we only have one configuration for the bootloader. Um, and, but we do want to have the ability to have multiple generations of the, same, of the NixOS system, right? That's, that's what we love about NixOS. Um, but we also don't want our new system to depend on previous systems. I'll get some quite people. So let's not include a bootloader config as part of the system package. But we do need to generate a bootloader config at some point. So we have a generator, and I think you can guess where we put that. So let's have a look at a real system package. Um, in a running NixOS system, there's a symlink at slash run slash current system, which points to the system package that's currently active. This package contains, amongst other things, the following. A symlink to the kernel image itself. Uh, often the bootloader can't load it directly from the root file system and needs it copied to a boot partition instead. Uh, the symlink makes that easy. A text file containing the kernel command line. Uh, I don't have the whole one because it's quite long. Um, a symlink to the init ramfs. Uh, NixOS uses a historic, but now technically inaccurate name, initrd. Like the kernel, this might have to be copied to a boot partition. A text file containing the NixOS version string. This is nice for decorative purposes. Uh, 
it's good to have the version in your boot entry name. The init script, this is the root file system one, which the init ramfs hands over to. Uh, it does a little setup before starting systemd, Nix OS a service manager, because systemd won't start successfully if its config isn't in place yet. And the switch to configuration script, which takes some steps to apply a NixOS configuration. This is what NixOS Rebuild does under the hood. Um, and what exactly it does depends a bit on the argument given. It, if you give it switch or test, it will measure the current state of the system and determine what needs to be done to move to the configuration defined by the system package. It then takes those steps in order to activate the system. Another thing the switch action does, which is also performed by the boot action, is to run the bootloader configuration script we talked about earlier, um, which looks at other generations of the system as well and generates bootloader config for all of them um, by, looking at the, by looking at the files that are part of that system. And the switch and boot actions may also install the bootloader. Uh, but that only happens when a particular environment variable is set or an argument is passed, uh, which NixOS install does so that you have a bootloader, but it's, it doesn't usually happen. So that concludes our whirlwind tour of how a classic Nix, a desktop NixOS installation boots. But what sets NixOS apart, besides, of course, declarative configuration, parallel installation of multiple systems, parallel installation of multiple versions of the same package, safe per user package management, rollbacks, easy and fearless patching, reproducibility, and all that is its flexibility. So what if, for example, we were to just put the entire NixOS system in an init RAMFS? The module that implements this is called NetBoot, because that, was it, what, that is what it was originally implemented for. Instead of generating an init RAMFS, which has the necessary bits and bobs to mount a local file system, it generates an init RAMFS, which contains the entire system and all of its dependencies. That's an easy way to boot the whole system from RAM uh, and is really useful for netboot, where a bootloader like IPXE will download the kernel and init RAMFS by the network, then boot it without having to touch any local persistent storage. It's quite heavy on RAM usage. Since the system and all its dependencies are loaded into RAM, the system on my laptop, for example, is 5.4 gigabytes in size, so I might not want to have it in RAM at all times. Of course, while the system doesn't need local, local persistent storage, it can still make use of it. For example, a swap partition can be used uh, to allow swapping out unused RAM, such as all the software you're not running right now, um, and make physical memory available for things that actually need it. Or you can use the, the init RAMFS as an installer. Uh, you, can in, you can use it to install NixOS to the local storage. That can be really useful uh, if, you're, if you want to provision a whole fleet of desktop machines or, or servers, or if using a USB stick installer is just not enough fun. Um, I've been in both situations. Uh, as an aside, nowadays the netboot image does not embed the entire system directly into the init RAMFS. Instead, it embeds a squash FS image, which can compress the file system a bit more efficiently than the CPIO archive and allows keeping it compressed in RAM, uh, unlike the init RAM FS, which is unpacked during boot. So that's a bit more efficient, uh, but still has the problem of using, using up all the RAM uh, as long as the system is loaded. There's also an open source project by Determinate Systems uh, called Nix Netboot Serve. Instead of constructing one big init RAMFS uh, image ahead of time within the Nix derivation, it puts them together from, from the constituent store paths on demand. The, re the end result is very similar, but allows much speedier iteration uh, since each store path is cached separately and only the par parts that change need to be recompressed. So NetBoot is great and all, but why limit yourself to booting it via iPixie? Linux has a nifty little bit of piece of functionality that allows it to act as a bootloader itself called kexec. The netboot image can be loaded via kexec without any further adjustments. The most common use case I've seen for this is uh, bootstrapping NixOS support from other Linux distributions on VPS providers that don't allow supplying a custom disk image or booting from custom ISOs. You build your netboot image on your workstation, I'll sync it to your Ubuntu machine, 
call KXNC with the appropriate parameters, and hey, presto, you have a NixOS system from which you can format the disk and use NixOS install to install the operating system you actually want. Um, I've also used it in the past instead of an ISO installer to make file system changes, which weren't possible in a running system which had the file systems mounted, which saves you the effort of uh, formatting a USB stick and having to boot into that. But another trick with similar applications is switch root. So let's go back to our normal init RAMFS. The init script in there uses the pivot root system call to tell the kernel to swap some mount points around, and that allows replacing the current root file system with the new one. But again, why limit ourselves? We, could, we, could, we can't only do that from an init RAMFS. Uh, systemd exposes a command that allows shutting down the running user space, but instead of powering off the machine or rebooting, um, this command will do exactly what the init RAMFS did. I'm sure it was originally intended for systems where systemd is used in the init RAMFS, but why shouldn't we use it outside the init RAMFS as well, right? So for example, uh, you can build a NixOS system and copy it to a tempfs, then switch root into that tempfs uh, and boot into NixOS from another distribution without leaving any traces besides shell history behind. Um, I've also used it to put an Ubuntu installation on my laptop without letting it touch the bootloader, without having to repartition the disk, and without having to mess around to get ZFS support in Ubuntu, since I was still running NixOS's kernel. The reuse, reuse of the kernel is what makes this approach applicable in some scenarios where kexec is infeasible, such as if the kernel you're using doesn't implement it or if it doesn't work on the platform that you're working on. Your mileage may vary for anything that re relies on the kernel here. Um, since the system you're switching into is very likely to have an incompatible set of kernel modules, which won't be loadable. This means that hot plugging devices whose drivers weren't already loaded or which need firmware files not provided by the target system will fail, for instance. But it's a bit more versatile than anything purely in a RAMFS based, since it can use real file systems. Uh, as mentioned, I, I put that Ubuntu on a ZFS dataset. So let's move on to something you're probably more familiar with. Um, custom ISOs. I'm sure this is one of the use cases many of you have used before. NixOS's own installer images are built from full NixOS configurations. Like the netboot module, the ISO image copies the system package into a SquashFS. It then takes the SquashFS, uh, the kernel of specialized init RAMFS, a bootloader with appropriate config, and, then, and the necessary bits and bobs for both BIOS and UEFI to recognize it as bootable, and bundles them together into an ISO image, which you can write to a USB stick, or if you're feeling nostalgic, to optical media. Single board computers often boot from SD cards. Uh, NixOS has the tooling for building SD images as well, since that's the use workflow users coming from other distributions have come to expect. Uh, generating non-installer images is a bit of an anti-pattern for a number of reasons. Uh, hit me up later if you want to hear me rant about it. But it can be very useful nonetheless. So if you're not working with hardware you can touch, VM, image, VM images can be very handy. You can generate a base image pre-configured with your SSH keys and standard tools to enable quickly spinning up new VMs. Just clone the image and boot the image, then deploy your configuration. Or you can configure the services you want the VM to provide, build an image from there, and boot without any further configuration or deployment steps. Uh, so here I'm going to show from my employer a bit more. Uh, Determinate Systems has been working on a tool called Ephemera, which given a, a NixOS configuration, Instead of building a disk image inside a Nix derivation, builds a NixOS system package into a disk image outside the sandbox. This allows caching some more parts, similarly to how Netboot, uh, Nix Netboot Serve does it, um, and enables parallelizing it a bit, it a bit more, and brings image build, build times to only a few seconds. Uh, the images are stateless, so it's expected that if the configuration needs to be altered, uh, the image will be replaced, but after all, the images are really cheap to build. Combined with the AWS snapshot upload tool called Snap, this allows going from a NixOS configuration to an AMI, faster than any other tool set for building AMIs known to us. Um, we're pretty proud of that. But Ephemera is by no means limited to AWS. It should be usable on any cloud provider that allows uploading custom disk images, 
And we've also tested it on uh, local QEMU VMs and on hardware. We're very excited about it, uh, but it's currently still in its early stages, and we haven't published it currently. Uh, feel free to ask us if you're interested. But even with ephemera, working with disk images isn't always the most convenient way. Since the NIC OS system package contains everything that you need to boot it, it's also pretty easy to run a NIC OS VM on a host that has NICs installed without any image generation. QEMU has a built-in file sharing implementation that allows sharing the host's NIC store to the guest's read-only and booting directly from that file share. NixOS allows generating scripts which take care of the tedious parts of building the QEMU commands for this. This is really great for um, <laughs> this is really great for testing configuration changes without deploying them to a persistent staging system or for build or without building images. I use these VMs to try out Nix packages changes for reviews uh, to test out software I'm not yet sure I want to use. And I've also experimented with using them for fully scripted NixOS installs onto physical media, but I don't trust myself to touch only the relevant physical media and not accidentally wipe my laptop in the process, so I do it in a VM. Um, and being able to shut the VM down afterwards makes cleanup much simpler, so I don't have to unmount the file systems, close uh, crypt setup volumes, et cetera, manually. However, this VM infrastructure is also used for what I believe is one of NixOS's wildest features, the full system VM-based integration testing. It runs QEMU VMs, or even networks of them, inside Nix builds to verify a huge range of functionality provided by NixOS. We have tests for a wide variety of installation setups, which boot the ISO to install on various combinations of LVM and LUX, as well as various file systems. The NixOS channels won't update if these tests are broken which allows us to make changes to the installers and file system support with confidence that we won't break it for everyone, or at least we'll usually find out before being confronted with disgruntled users. We also have tests for net many NixOS modules. The NextCloud tests ensure that all three supported <laughs> NextCloud versions work with four different database configurations. So we have 12 different configurations which are tested. Um, our networking tests ensure that a client can talk to an external network through a router with NAT, also an XOS VM, and that our firewall works correctly. We even have an open arena test, which pulls up a network of VMs, runs a game server on one, and bot clients on the others, and takes screenshots of the action. And all of this is within the Nix sandbox. Uh, so these tests are completely independent of online services and won't break from one day to the next due to external circumstances. NixOS makes heavy use of them, but I'm sure there are many use cases outside Nix packages that would be well served by the NixOS test infrastructure. Now, NixOS isn't suitable for all machines that can run Linux, uh, because some of them are too, uh, don't have enough RAM or enough storage. But that doesn't mean we can't give them the Nix treatment. Thanks to Nix packages' cross-compilation support and some kernel patches I crib from OpenWRT, I run a small Linux system built with Nix on my Wi-Fi access point. It's a little kernel in initRAMFS, which I currently boot via the network. Uh, and the init is just a cell shell script that starts the necessary bits to supply network connectivity and drop there for SSH access. But I haven't really needed that SSH access since setting it up, because it just works. Uh, the, one, the biggest problem I had with it was uh, when I wanted to take this picture, I accidentally unplugged it, and then my Wi-Fi was gone. Um, but yeah. Uh, Daniel Barlow's gone a bit further with the concept, and his work predates mine and inspired it a bit as well. Uh, and he wrote Nix WRT, uh, though I gather he's currently rewriting it as Liminix, uh, which supports a wider range of devices and more use cases, including router setups and things like that. And in principle, it can run on anything that OpenWRT runs on. Might need some extra work, though, for some platforms. Um, Samuel DR also has some interesting projects going on around building embedded Linux systems with Nix. Uh, I believe he originally started this in order to, uh, to create this Toboot installer, um, which he builds with Nix, but isn't based on Nix OS. Uh, but he's, he's been working on how to generalize that into a, into a more universally applicable uh, embedded Linux system build framework. Um, not dissimilar from um, 
build route, for example, in use cases, I believe, uh, called Ceylon. It's still in its early stages, but uh, he's got both the Toboot installer building with it, and he's built uh, operating systems for a variety of obscure emulation consoles using it. So I think there's a lot of space to be explored there. And I'm looking forward to what Samuel DR, Dan, and the rest of the community will dream up over the next few years. So let's talk about Netboot again. I'm not going to start talk, uh, I'm going to start talking about things that I haven't done before and that might not have general practical implementations yet, so take these with a grain of salt. Serving a full system in at RAMFS is an easy way to get your Nix OS on a machine, providing it has enough RAM and or swap, but it's certainly not the most efficient. Uh, because you're downloading the whole system before you can even start booting properly. Um, classical netboot setups only serve a small Linux RAMFS containing the network, uh, network drivers and configuration for mounting a network file system as the root. This is, of course, also possible with Nix OS. Uh, certain properties of Nix make it possible to do this much more efficiently as well. For instance, the Nix store is practically append only. Once a path is there, it will only change in very unusual circumstances, and even then it should be functionally equivalent. This means that store paths can be cached by clients indefinitely. This would combine the flexibility and central manageability of classic netboot setups with the performance of a local installation. There's a lot of room for creativity here. Um, since store paths are immutable and can be signed, they can be obtained safely from untrusted sources. This makes peer-to-peer -peer distribution possible, meaning that the netboot server can be provisioned far more economically without impacting performance. Again, in theory, I haven't done this in practice. So a lot of operating systems can boot in these ways. What I think is fairly unique to NixOS is that because everything is pulled together, the, together from a declarative config into an immutable package, it's much easier to do all these things. You can take the NixOS configuration running on your laptop, factor out any bits of, that are specific to the hardware, and then get your laptop's configuration running in any of these environments in a matter of minutes. You can build installer images with pre-configured Wi-Fi and SSH so that you can install on hardware remotely. You can put Super Tuxcart and Open Arena in for geeky open source LAN parties. I generated NixOS images with a patch version of another open source game a couple of years ago to allow my Windows using friends to play with some of the bugs fixed. The possibilities are endless. Uh, the NixOS generators project pulls several of these options together into one convenient command, and it's a great way to get started playing with some of these. So you can probably tell I'm quite excited about all this. If you're excited about it too, I'd love to hear if you implement the peer-to-peer -peer super cached NixOS uh, netboot setup, or if you come up with and implement some even more exotic ideas. Find me at the hackathon, or feel free to drop me a message on Matrix. Thank you. And <laughs> and I've got links to a number of the things I've mentioned up on there. Um, is there time for questions? Thank Happy you. to take any. Of course, there's some sound. <laughs> uh, here we go again. <laughs> there's probably no sound because I'm not sending anything to her. Um, do people want to yell for questions? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, and I'll, I'll repeat the question so the I'm not sending anything. So. <laughs> uh, cool. So thank you for the great talk. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering how far can we go with something with Cryo, uh, which uh, is Checkpoint and Restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, in order to make like live migration of actual NixOS machine uh, easy. Like, uh, what kind of use case can this unlock mm -hmm. uh, in terms of everything we do? Um, was the stream able to hear that, or should I repeat the question? OK, um, so Ryan asked if. Uh, what, what, what uh, Cryo, check, Checkpoint and Restore in user space, uh, might enable with this. That's exactly one of the exotic use cases I was hoping to hear about, which I didn't think about myself. Uh, it sounds really cool. Uh, I, yeah, that, that sounds exciting, and I don't really know. <laughs> Thank you for 
I think there is no question. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh. <laughs> so um, it's not really a question, but I think it should be mentioned that the NixOS tests are even faster by now because of you, because uh, you fixed the 9P file uh, driver. My system driver, and uh, so the Nixos tests are even greater, and I think that should be mentioned. Thank you. Um, thank you. I considered putting some shameless self-promotion in there, but decided not to. Uh, I have a blog post on that if anyone's interested. Uh, you can find my blog right there. Cool. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah.